All right. So uh, this will take about 30 minutes with no interruptions. So I'm betting on an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, we're, I'm going to talk about the new erasure encoding infrastructure that we're putting in place in 4.2. And why erasure encoding? Well, because we have replication, but not integrity in Flex Files v1. And by replication, I mean client side mirroring makes multiple copies of the same file, but they're, the resilvering process simply picks a copy, says it's good, and there's no way to ensure that you get the right. Uh, the, the right data. So we're going to add integrity. Um, are you sure you want to use the word integrity? What do you want me to? Use? I, I'm I'm not being uh, okay. Um, so this is is it end to end? It's from the client onto storage and back. Yes. Um, so we add we add uh, be, besides the whatever the erasure encoding algorithm itself does to ensure yeah. integrity of the data. We also add CRC 32s before we send it on the wire. And when we read it back off the wire to ensure that the packet itself did not get corrupted. Okay. So we can come back to it. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've already been knocked in the word protection and by okay. Christoph and Consistency protection information is a term that that's used for block storage. Okay, or PI for short. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll come back. Um, so we're going to call it client side erasure encoding because we have client side mirroring. We don't need to be original, and we're going to add replication redundancy and parity. What does it really mean? What it really means? so the, the the core of what we're changing is we're going to start writing and reading blocks. And we're not going to be doing a byte stream. So the write block, read block, we'll see this in a minute. And writes are staged for consistency. So I am using consistency, not consistent. And some terms that I'm also using for it are committed and uncommitted. I'm not sure if I'm if I'm sold on these terms because we already have the commit flag in the write block itself for how is the write supposed to be committed. So we might call these something else. Okay. Uh, I, and by the way, this is some of the earliest that we've exposed work on a new draft coming into the standards body, right? So the really looking for help and feedback and we'll, we'll, we'll take that, all right? Reads only return consistent blocks, and I'm not going to define consistency now. I, I'll wait to define it a little later. Well, can you define read? Are you talking about a, uh, an NFS read from a server? Are you talking about what the application? I'm talking about the read from from the server or right to the server, to the data server. It, 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 but the servers, the data servers don't have. Uh, we're introducing this, new operations. The data, the data is opaque to them. The erasure yes. costs are opaque to the server. So yes. how do they return consistent reads? I guess they, I don't understand what let's the, let's wait till we get to that <laughs> that word. All right. Fair enough. So there are right now there are five new operations: commit a block, read a block, commit, commit, where that think of it as reading the header status, but not the data of what's at the block location, read block and rollback block, where rollback will allow us to roll back cache data that's not committed. And again, this is, we're stumbling over terms that may indicate we need to just read, right? And write block, which writes blocks to a file. And- uh, so, the, so this is outside of uh, PNFS or- No, well, yes, it is outside of PNFS. Right. So what actually occurs is, um, when the DS registers with the MDS, right, when they do an exchange ID dance, there's currently flags to say, I'm doing an, I'm an a D, MDS, I'm a DS, I'm a DS without PNFS, et cetera. And I'm in, I'll, in, it's not in these slides, but I introduce a new flag to say that I can support encoding type operations. Okay. And I'll show you that it doesn't matter what encoding type you are because these functions are agnostic to the encoding type flavor. The server doesn't care about that. Right. Right, okay, got it. 
So as long as you can write the whole block out, yeah. you can write the whole blocks are good. Okay. Yeah. So are you going to talk a little bit about the motivation for uh, introducing these functions? We'll get to the right holes. You, you saw the slide before. You know everything <laughs> is coming up. We have to hope. Yeah. Well, I'll just go with the with, with what I have. So the other thing that's important here is we're going to mix encoding types. So we're going to allow uh, a layout to have a mirrored. Um, it's, it can have a Mojet or it could have Reed Solomon. Right now, these are the ones I've been looking at. And so adding them to be extended. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and each and actually, this is going to become a registry, the enum. Um, okay. And at, just like the layout type, so as you define a new encoding type in a specification, you will ask the IANA to extend the registry for this new value. Okay. All right. So, so, this is what I, so IANA, IANA has the yeah registry. Okay. Right. Um, so we we have a we have a layout. A layout has mirrors. And the mirrors can have an encoding type. And so one one example would be, um, let's say we're trying to import or export data from uh, a file that's encoded. We want to, uh, we, we've got an, an old server and we want to bring it in. And so we would have uh, a clock, we would have some some program running on a client that's that's sucking it in. Well, while it's sucking it in, it's going to read it off of the, the encoded mirror on mirror zero and write it out to mirror one in this example, so read Solomon uh, format. So when it reads it from, from mirror zero, it's going to use a stock NFS read? Yes. Okay. There's no possibility of using the, the block reads for nope. uh, uh, without any kind of erasure encoding? Nope. No, I, I don't envision that at all because uh, I'm sorry, you could do you could define a new encoding type that said there is no encoding and you could fill in the data. There's nothing that prevents that. Mm -hmm. Right, but if you're trying to read a plain file that ha it doesn't have this block header information, you mm -hmm. won't be able to to do so. Okay, so silvering in this instance is going to add some metadata per block. Yes. And so that, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, some terms. Data block is what's in the page calf on the client. Block is what the generated block on the wire, whether we're reading or writing it. And it doesn't have to be the same size as the data block, right? So with Read Solomon, it happens to be the same size. With Majet, it's not. Um, it tends to boil down into a block that's one kilobyte. A 4K data block becomes one kilobyte as a block, but what happens is there are six of them instead of one. So it's act to the way we've got it encoded, it'll end up you'll take uh, half as much data. The header is the metadata per block. Half and, again as much. Half, yeah. Yes. Half again, got it. Yeah. And the payload is, if you think about the stripe going across the data servers, that's the payload. Okay. This terms that you'll hear me use. And so erasure encoding is we're, we're taking um, the data blocks. We've got two data blocks in this example. We're applying them through the algorithm and we're generating a payload that's going to uh, however many data servers we have here. And inside the header, we have the block ID, which is um, basically the offset within the, within the, the data server's file of the block, so it's your, your block number, your index, all right? We have a change ID. A change ID is a timestamp on the client, all right? And it is, the, it should be monotonic, sequentially incrementing. And a client ID, the client ID is the client ID assigned by the metadata server, all right? And so that way, the it'll be unique per client doing the right. So the combination of the client ID and the change ID is sufficient to identify a transaction that was applied. Okay, so again, to be clear, you, you're putting a, an extra header on each of the data files. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, so. so and, all right, sorry, go ahead. Go no. Ahead. no, no, no I'll let me think. Let me okay. Let me the question. Not each of the data files, each of the data 
Well, use of the data blocks. Okay. Yes. Got it. Okay. So why aren't you using the client ID generated by the data server? If this is because the, that way, the, that the data server generates it, and you can't tell which is on the different data servers the same client. Data server one gives you client ID five. Data server two gives you client ID thirteen. How can you be? You have to correlate them. Yes. Well, but I, I don't understand why you need client ID at all in this header. We'll get to that. Okay. You need it. You need it for <laughs> being able to detect transactions. Okay. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, the sequence ID is basically which block are you in the payload, and uh, it allows the when you read the block back in, it allows the coding algorithm to determine the order of the blocks so that it can apply its algorithm on them. Uh, the effective length, remember I talked about the data block and the block can be different sizes. So the effective length allows you to say, uh, in the example, one of them's at three kilobytes, and that allows you to make sure that you reconstruct the data appropriately. And the CRC32 is applied to the header and data. I've got it. Another slide that shows this explicitly, and again, the payload is each one of these going across. Why did you choose CRC thirty two? Simply because that's what they gave me. Because it's not the strongest. No, it's it's fast though. It's and, fast. And, and it's and fast for, and implementable for, in hardware. For four K, one K blocks, it's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. 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 I'll bet you get an argument about the algorithm. Yeah. Oh, he just did. <laughs> something, something more modern would be better. Yeah. Or, or maybe allowing the flexibility of, you know, an implementation choosing which CRC to use. No, the, point, use the point is that you're, you're using this to implement it, the erasure coding. So the CRC is really only there in order to give you an idea of whether or not the, uh, the block, the header, and the data are consistent. Yeah, you know, it's so not it really. With yeah, the, it's it's yeah. not really part of any of the erasure coding itself. The erasure coding happens. But that's that can Doesn't yeah. the encoding right. protect right. protect the data anyway? I mean, why do you... yeah, the encoding protects the data, but not the header? You want you want to know you want to know whether or not the payload and that is on. These data server is actually um, a consistent and b consistent with what's on the other data servers, right? Because they're all part of one erasure coded block, right? But, but yeah. yeah, but you're applying this algorithm to every piece of every byte of data that's going. So that seems inefficient. I mean, you're doing a double, you're doing a double encoding. Basically, you're doing the CRC 32 per block and you're doing erasure encoding across the whole payload. That seems like it's unnecessary redundancy. Yeah. No, it's not. You can't, you can't guarantee without, without being able to show that the <clears throat> header and, and data are consistent, then if you have multiple writes happening at the same time, and that may happen in the scenarios that we are envisioning, then you may have a mixture of different erasure coded blocks. So you're you're protecting the sequence ID, obviously. And what else? Oh, the block ID, the the, the client ID, the so yeah, you're storing an offset in there as well. Because you wanna you wanna catch misordered or mis misdirected writes. Yes, you're not storing an offset. You're storing to at an at the pre-calculated offset, so you don't need to worry about this. The offset. The so, offset. so how do you catch misordered writes or misdirected writes? So there's the timestamp, change ID, and then there's the CRC thirty-two. Those two sort of act together to ensure that the header is is the same on all the clients and then this the the data is actually consistent with the header yeah. belongs the header belongs to the block that was yes. returned exactly. yeah exactly. it's really just the association the crc is okay. just protecting that association if they got separated that would be bad 
you know, make sure they're still yeah. together. And then the integrity of the block is whatever the back end. So do um, you expect there to be possibly fragmented rights of those blocks? And other torn rights? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it frees the server to actually implement it non as non atomically writing this the header separately from the data. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. Okay. All right, so decoding is just going backwards, right? And we'll, we'll see in the example here, if we look at block ID one, evidently someone has written to the file since the, this client last read it. Uh, and note, uh, the other thing I wanna point out, again, to trail, really drive this home is the change ID for client ID six is three and the change ID for client ID Seven is three, but they're not the same three, right? So you can't say just because those change IDs are the same that it's the same transaction. It's a combination, right? They each have their own sequence number. Yeah. So yeah. you haven't defined what you mean by transaction. Uh, uh, the a right. A, a right is a transaction. So the transaction is the 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 writing of the data is what I'm defining as a transaction. It may not be what you want it. To, that should be in the glossary before we get to these slides, just to a random okay. comment. All right. Um, so we, we have the idea. I, I want to now go into how do we take these slides and convert them into uh, XDR, for example. So we have the block owner, which, uh, you know, we're, it's got the block ID, the change ID, a client ID, and committed. And committed is a an operation that when you write and you use a block owner, it means nothing. When you read back and you see the block owner, it tells you whether or not the transaction has commit, been committed, not whether or not the write has been committed. Okay. And uh, we were talking a little bit this yesterday, Jeff. The you, you can't compare client IDs because they're opaques and right. Even if implementations happen to have the same basic algorithm for defining them, you can't, you just can't be guaranteed for that. Okay. Um, so there are two flags. One is update to header only. If you have, for example, a Reed Solomon uh, algorithm approach, you might have. Uh, Two blocks or three blocks, and then four, say four, four data block, four blocks of, of information, and then two blocks of parity. And you could change one of the blocks and not change the other three and update the parity information. And you might not want to send those additional three blocks because you don't want to take the overhead of sending on the wire. So we have an, an algorithm that'll do that. And then uh, when you do the right, it could be efficient if there is an empty hole at that position that you automatically commit. It actually, in my mind, causes more problems than it's worth, but that's why we made it a flag. The words update parity make me very nervous. Yeah. Hopefully, I can write it better than they. Well, yeah, I mean, that's just nervous. It's like, well, I'm sending you a little bit of data. I want you to update your, you know, final answer to whatever this data changes and the other thing. That that just sounds risky as hell. Yeah. But, you know, the internet got burned by packet forwarders scribbling on checksums okay. and not checking data. So be, be careful about it. Yeah, it's, it's an optimization. I'm, I don't have a if, problem. If you can do it safely, it's great. I love the idea. Yeah. But, Update parity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, okay. Um, and, and so there, the a flags of zero has meaning, right? So zero means update the whole block and the header, and don't commit it if it's empty. No, zero means nothing. The, oh, the so flag. The, the the flags are required. One or the other or both must be set. No, one or the other. If they're set, so let me. What does it mean if there's no flag set? That's my question. It means commit. Do not commit as empty. And that you're expecting to not update the header only. 
Maybe you ought to just define what flag zero means. Okay. You know, throw another line in there. So, say, so commit everything. By, by the way, that's that's not uh, an approach that we've taken Is it? in the standards body inside our, our working group to date. All right. Uh, okay. I, that's a big statement, but okay. No, I, I, I'm pretty familiar with the XDR, and I don't recall as having set the zero by itself. Okay. Well, it's confusing to the casual reader okay. what zero might mean. If you can deconfuse that. Yeah. Reader, that'd be great. Good point. Okay. Um, so we define a right a right block. It has the CRC, the effective length, the flags, and the block of the that's being sent. And the right block four args are uh, for example, the offset, the state ID, which better be zeros as defined. Uh, for PNFS and uh, the owner and the sequence ID. So the owner and the sequence ID are applied to all blocks within it. So we've pulled it out to this level. The offset is the offset in the file to which to the, the, the block. block offset in the file. Okay. Right. Okay. And the result is the count of blocks, then the committed, which I, I'm not talking about th this committed at all because. I want us to get a buy off of the approach before we go back and fill in all the right semantics. Um, and then the the owners. And let's look at an example right. Um, so we, we're we're writing three blocks and the uh, you can see that we have uh, CRC is calculated. So the CRC is calculated against the offset, the sequence ID, the BO change ID, the BO client ID, the CRC as, as if it were zero, and then the effective length, and then the block of data. So these are all of the values which are required to, to calculate the CRC. Um, obviously, since I have this giver shop here, I made up CRCs at, at will. And, um, and the CRC block is packed. There's no gaps in that. Right. Yeah. Um, the and what we can see is the output is that it must have been committed if empty was on because these blocks are committed. Um, wow, I should just look on this screen, it's a little tighter. Um, we see the block IDs, uh, the change IDs are all the same. So pretty vanilla example. And one of the intent with these, these examples is to try to reinforce the rules. Now we have a read block, which is an offset in blocks and a count in blocks. Uh, returns uh, you know, what we would expect, the, the, the header values, and then the blocks, and uh, EOF to say that we're done uh, with the file. So we went and read uh, those blocks that we just put up earlier. We see uh, what we expect to see here. Um, we, we see the, the, the block IDs, the change IDs, et cetera. And then we can calculate the CRC based on the block index will tell us what the uh, sequence, the, the block ID is, the sequence ID and exam, you know, the same example. So we'll be able to tell whether or not the data was um, has integrity versus what was the transaction was. Can you go back to the last one? Yes. Or one more. Go back. Um, I think this is what you want. Oh, that was right block. Yeah. And then, oh, maybe you did already. Go, now go forward to the read block. Yeah. And the res. Okay, now we get it. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. It's odd that you put the CRC first, but okay, in the in the structure, but that's fine. Um, I wouldn't want it last because I don't want. Yeah, you'd want it after the sequence. It, it's, yeah. it's it's a new one. right. Yeah. No, those are the type of nits that that drive people crazy. Uh, so a right hole. So we were talking earlier about torn rights and about other things. So these are basically the cases that we care about. Um, a single client overwriting an existing block. Well, 
maybe the DS is partitioned or the client dies or the DS dies. Uh, and then multiple clients trying to write to the same location are the other concern. So a, a client overwrite example would be we've got, we're writing two blocks to offset one. We get three blocks back, okay? And this is where we start talking about the, the committed and uncommitted. Mm -hmm. So the, the committed block earlier was block ID one, change ID two, client ID six. We've now got a change ID three and a client ID six that we haven't committed because um, we need to examine the data to see it's two phase transactional, right? And so now it's up to the the client to say, okay, now I want to uh, I want to go. You know, which one am I going to take? I'm going to apply this. Uh, he'll do a commit block. Uh, Okay, and then if another client were to read right away, he would not see this. Notice that both of the blocks that the client is reading are committed. So the the prior middle block of, for block one, which is not committed, is not visible to another client until it is committed, right? So we want to ensure that we have consistent, I'll get to consistent in a moment, so the, the Payloads are consistent, but they could be gibberish, right? You know, the, the, the sequential reads could be now don't make any sense. So the uncommitted block becomes a hole in the pod. Is that what you're saying? So the uncommitted. Well, not really a hole. It's not like it would return zero. It would fail, but right. it's, it's like it, know, it's good, 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 good. It, it'll yeah. be more evident in the further okay. examples where we have. Okay. Right. So a consistent payload. A payload is consistent if all the contained blocks have basically the same change ID and client ID. All right. So we can look at a payload and tell right away whether or not the it's going to be able to be deciphered. Uh, it has integrity if all of the contained blocks are consistent and they all pass the CRC32 checks. Well, the CRC32 and the well, no, no, I'm talking about the pay. I'm not talking about when the. Uh, so a payload has integrity versus data has integrity. Uh, data has integrity so when you do the algorithm. So this last line is only referring to the data. Uh, the, the pay, the, the stuff on the wire. The, the, it's the header and the block information. Right. right. That they match, that they describe the same state. Yeah, if you will, a yes. block on the back end. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hard to keep all those straight. The one yeah. past the CRC thirty two checks, just there's a fragment statement there, right? There's, what would there's you something prefer? hiding behind. What would you prefer instead of pass? I don't know. All right. To fix consistency, we have two tools, commit block and roll black block. Mm. Um Commit will take an uncommitted block and make it committed, and roll black will take an uncommitted one and throw it away. So I think there are two separate aspects of committing. One is persistence, and the other one is visibility. Is that right? Yes. So you can have so an uncommitted block means it's not visible to other. Yes. Okay. So that's not what commit means for for legacy versions. Of yes, and and we we talked at the very beginning that a better term. Yeah, you need you need to do something about. Yeah, that it's very confusing. Yeah. All right. So then, when it's committed, that means it's visible. Yes. It doesn't say anything about the durability of the data. Correct. Yeah. You need another term. Yeah. Reveal block. Um, <laughs> we we have these sure. bits in RDMA space with persistent memory. Okay. Yeah. There's there's yeah, same there's, problem. There's, same problem. Yeah. yeah. It, it's the same damn thing and it drives you friggin' crazy. Yeah. You need flush operations, you need commit operations, you need all sorts of stuff. They mean different things in different places and 
Well, the terminology varies right. depending on whether you're talking to a memory guy or a storage guy. You're right, exactly. Yeah. So, when, and, you, and then CXL. Someone says committed, it's, it's, not, it's not immediately clear what that means. So right, but, <laughs> but the word visible, while it's very pertinent for describing the problem here, Chuck, is not one that I would want to introduce. Uh, in. uh, and it's. So, in order to be visible, it had better also persisted. Oh, because, oh, because, because, because oh, yeah. the whole point, the whole point here is to fix up the situation where you've sort of been writing out a, um, uh, you've been writing out erasure of encoded data and you haven't been able to write enough data to be able to actually either reconstruct the old data or reconstructed new data. So, so I actually you're, you're, you triggered. We talked about this last week so, and I did add verbiage to the spec saying that if the, if it's not persisted, you can't change it to committed. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so even if you have automatic committal with an empty block, it will not come back as committed if it's not persisted. Yes. That, that's good, but the spec needs to say that. No, it does. It does say that. Okay, I didn't good. say it in my presentation. Okay, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, I, I think, I think I agree, absolutely. But yeah, it needs so to be you're good. dealing with uh, being able to guarantee the, uh, um, rights on separate, uh, in separate domains and separate data servers. Yeah. Yes. That that's also a new thing well, for uh, for NFS. So. Yeah, that that bears spelling out. Because erasure coding, you know, it requires you to have a certain number of of blocks in order to be able to do a full reconstruction of the of the data. Yeah. And yeah. if because of these are being written to different data servers, they are not atomic. And yeah. you know, the, rights, the rights the rights are not atomic. And so you need you need that extra layer of the, the transactional layer that, that that Thomas is defining here in order to be able to either create new a new block and be guaranteed that you have all the data that you need in order to to read to uh, uh, meet the, the erasure coding you have your requirements. Yeah. Right. Um, or you need to be able to roll back to the old data. Right. Right. So the server's gonna need to keep both of these around. And yes, children. not both. There can be more than one, more right. than two. Yeah, okay. more than I was, two. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask. Continue to. Yeah. 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 Right. So, my friends who work in the Azure cloud were sweating this kind of thing yeah. several years ago, and yeah, and they regretted never signed up for it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is this is the kind of problem that anybody who does erasure coding has to I know. face. I yeah. Know. yeah. So you're, it might sucks work. to be you. I know. Yeah. I yeah, know. And, and it's particularly challenging access. here on NFS because we have that's kind of a protocol that's not necessarily always reliable. You know, it's so it's the and goosey. And yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's second that's rule why. on the attributes. But, but yeah. I, see, I see the need for all the extra yeah, that's checks on the layering. That's why you need you need that infrastructure of the. Yeah. Complex, but yeah, okay. okay. I guess. So if we want to, if we want to draw a parallel with uh, cloud uh, file services, they tend to do this thing with blocks underneath the file service endpoint. So none of it is really visible to the clients. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No. yeah, right. So they use a tool like Paxos or something else to uh, to get uh, appropriate quorum when they have like three or five replicas of a, of a block of data. And, and, yeah. Yep. They have yeah. intermediaries and geo replication. Yes. God knows what else hiding behind you. But so I would case you're interested in exposing it to the client because you want uh, to enable parallelized IO. Yes. And I want the client to be able to repair yeah. if it needs to. So you basically need a, a log, a log semantics. Yeah. 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 Now that is an interesting twist that the client can say, oh no, you're all wrong. Override, start over. Here's a good block again. Yeah. yeah. The Look, source of truth is the client, not the server. Yeah, yeah but that's just interesting. Has to be. Yeah. 
I know. And that's going to make it awfully complicated. Yeah. That's why you have all these role plays. Yeah. yeah. Boy, yeah, you really do need them to be trusted. Well, yeah, that would yep. help. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and that, that'll be next IETF meeting where we'll talk about the. Not Dublin, but the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, for example, I've committed a block. Uh, and we might want to roll back a block and notice that roll rolling back does not resolve all consistency. Uh, well, I, I think I have an example, a couple slides where we can have. Um, we can have a mixture of client ID six and a client ID seven on the different data servers because who wins the race and as we define rollback, we can't roll back everything. Oh my God! You've got two clients trying to roll back. Yeah. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God. Yeah. And and well, look at the slide. The slide okay. talks about. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, if you notice, if you look carefully, you can see that on client ID ten, one on DS one, but it lost on DS two. You you can see the block zero and block one have flipped the uh -huh. the owner. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is something that concerns me is they both detect the lack of consistency. Who gets to repair it? Right. right. That's the question. And, and this is why I always go back to the client ID and why I'm pointing out that the client ID is opaque and you can assume nothing about it. Right. You, they could squeal. They could both squeal to the MDS and say, pick one of us to fix it. Or they could say, whoever's got the smallest client ID, whatever that means. So, I mean, where does this client ID come from, actually? And, and how do it you comes from the MDS. It comes from the MDS. Yes. Okay. And and, and, it, and it can't be this. Okay, yeah, because the other one is, is determined by that. Well, no, the, the short form client ID could be could be used, I suppose. For but then you and yeah. so this is not the same as a client ID that sees for a second. Client or an exchange ID, right? Right. That's what I'm wondering. If, could you use the 32 bit change at the exchange ID, the, the short form ID? Yeah. We might have to go to that. That might make the best sense, but. Or alternatively, to the problem is that changes with depending on how your exchange ID goes. So it's not persistent across. Well, so if you, if you, you know, crash, your client crashes and comes back. So the, the only difference is the 64 bit one gives you is you can detect that it's a different instance of the boot. So one way to solve that yeah. is, is to. Is to have the clients report as an error and then have the server recall the layouts and only hand back a layout to one. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. the clients look at the timestamps of whoever is there? No, you can't assume that your timestamp and their timestamp are the same. Uh, well, they're not, they might not be the same, but they'll be the same difference. So the clients can make a decision. And that matches. That. Yeah, I, I don't either. That one makes me cringe. Well, it depends on whether or not giving. Like if he races also in. Mm -hmm. there's, there's also the timing issue of. Um, when you receive the replies for all your rights, mm -hmm. you know, and that can. The, the the one that receives the 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 replies the you know the first finishes first he might be able to um, see you know most of the timestamps but perhaps not all of them because the other guy hasn't finished doing his stuff you know it's it's that kind of thing that you have to work and then about. what about if they actually have the same exact change ID. Well, yeah, you know, you can't tell. That's yeah. So, so in my mind, this is a big hole in what we have. We have to define. There are ways to do it. Yeah, there are ways to do it. We just haven't defined them. Yeah. The the source of truth is is the the problem, right? If yeah. the clients assert themselves as the source of truth. How do we resolve that? Well, yeah. So we're, we're, you're, you're, you're writing these blocks disconnected, and so and there's no coordination well, at all between the clients. Well, so like, I mean, in most in most cases, the expectation is that the clients are actually writing this disjoint. Sure. Right. Parts of the of, of, of the file. It's just that 
they happen to be not block aligned, and so they map to the same back end. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Screwed, right. exactly. so yeah. that's what you have to. That's that's really the kind of a problem that we mostly want to optimize for solving. Yeah, you know, or prevent from ever happening. Or prevent from ever right. happening. Right. Right. Yeah. But, but that's really, I, then you've got the case where, you know, they both write on the same, to the same bot bytes and, and that, you know, that just gets really screwed. But, oh my God. You take um, the left side and I'll take the right side. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, I don't want to interject this in the middle of your talk, so we probably yeah. finish, but I, I have a thought on something. But. So then we have a, an example where the client uh, died while it was in the middle of the writes, yeah. right? So it wrote to two and three, did not write to one and four. And by the way, we can tell it didn't write because uh, EOF is true and there's zero in the, the blocks. Well, EOF, he might be right yeah. in the middle. Thing, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, and we, we also should notice another problem. Notice on data server one, it if COF is false, well, on data server two, it's true. So that means there's an additional block on data server three that's on not on any of them, right? So how do we fix this? We we either need to hole punch or have rollback block work on committed blocks. You don't want to hole punch because you don't want the other clock. No, 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 no. no. Zero. First, first question is who fixes it? Oh, in this you're, case, you're, 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 no, in this case, in this case, it's the client who's reading it okay. would know. I, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm hypothetically right. Yeah, he's you, the you one who client that died halfway through an update. Now what? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the next client that comes along has to go and repair this. So, so, but, but, but he doesn't know what the data was. He does. Well, he can roll back. That's where he has to roll it back, right? right. Oh, so he right. rolls it back before any failure, and then now he's got to write his block at a new offset because he. Just threw away a bunch of bytes that he knew were there. Well, well, he threw away some bytes by somebody. But right he gone. may not have any rights. This might be a pure read. But, and, and there's another problem too. How do you? How does the second client tell the difference between? Uh, oh, I've I've got an inconsistency like this, and the client is because the client died, and I've got. Oh, I'm just looking at it halfway in in the yes. middle. Yes, yes. We we, we I... so the, the the server knows that. Uh, so the server is really the one that has to uh, organize the res rescue rescue. Right. Operation. So we, we have error flags that he can say this is inconsistent. <laughs> Go. Yeah. Because the server knows that. Well, yeah. But practically <laughs> speaking, it means that there's an uncommitted block. Yes. Somewhere yeah. near the, yeah. the error. Yeah. And the client, the client, when it reads those blocks, it'll see you know, I've got, I I don't have enough headers to actually uh, recreate my recreate valid data, you know, because the, it'll, it'll see, say, three headers uh, from from the from one client and then three headers from the other, um, and it will notice that they, the timestamps, et cetera, do not match, so it'll know that I need some other way of reconstructing the data, and that will force okay. it to go to look at, you know, can I do rollbacks and things? But yeah, I think you're right. The server has to mediate yeah. this. So, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, the, 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 or the MDS has to yeah, mediate this. Because, so. because it, it's the only thing that knows that that client is actually dead. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, so you kind of do need some some sort of yeah. like like the short form client ID in there as the yeah. as the thing because the because that's the only thing that's going to tell you what the and maybe we, the server has to be a little bit more careful about using those. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, for example, we you were just talking, Jeff, about racing rights. Yeah. The client could read the data, notice that it's not consistent across the payload, and uh, it could uh, it could retry. You know, wait a minute, retry to see if it becomes consistent. Uh, it can report a layout error to the MDS, or we could check for uncommitted blocks, and we would find that we have some uncommitted changes on uh, DS1 and DS4. And well, I haven't read this since Friday. So, so you're, so, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, and so it, it could do the commit for the client, but it doesn't know the client's dead. So again, it's the, what we're saying is we contact the MDS, 
MDS knows it's dead. Yeah. The MD MDS can assign someone to repair this. In this case, it knows that since those are uncommitted and they're consistent with the others, it's safe to go ahead and commit that right for the client that died. Uh, very multiple writers, right? So we we have what like client ID basically six ten, and by the way, six has rebooted at some point because the upper thirty two bits, if we're assuming in Linux or Hammerspace, has changed. Again, I, I'm just trying to drive home. Yeah, yeah. You can't do anything with the client ID yeah, yeah. for anything. Um, so you got a new short form client ID. Going, yeah. And uh, and you need to. Yeah. yeah. So we we have to repair it. Um, so some of the issues I've really identified: automatic commit can lead to blocks that can't be backed out. So if we're if we're not committing them automatically, we we wouldn't have the problem where we had. Uh, two blocks that were were there, and the other the rest of the blocks never made it because the client died. Mm -hmm. They just wouldn't show up in the first place. Uh, the decision to repair is hard, but we have to push it off to the MDS, right? Yeah. So this is an argument that automatic committal cannot be part of. This. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. And, and that the, like it's writing not like it, it exists, and we have to be careful. Yeah. It's it's that it should. Oh, I probably yank it out. Right, because okay. this, these slides drove that point home to me as I put the examples together. Right. right. Uh, how does the data server implement the blocks? There, they, it could be a logging file system. They could roll their own data files. Uh, but remember, we want these writes to be atomic. And uh, so. You basically have to do data, data journaling. Yes. Yeah. So this is not something you can do with a typical file system that's already been implemented. Yeah, you, you, could, have, you could, you could, you could, uh, have, you have to build on top of it. Yeah, you, could, you, could, you, could, you can't do it with just a regular old file. You have can, to. Can can SD could maintain its own journey if you wanted it to, right? I'm saying that code change would be required. That yes. Seems yeah. to be agreed. Yeah. Yes. And as we already mentioned, the data server doesn't care about what type of algorithm the client is using. It just stores the blocks. So that if we um, if we develop the data servers to do this, then that'll free up anyone doing the encoding type to not worry about that. And just to back up again, local accessors would not be able to look at data written with a read with a write block and they look back, it. right? You'd have to use a loop back if that's yeah. yeah. And you you don't have to know the erasure encoding or the encoding type. Um, but you might want to influence it. Like yeah. you might say, I want geo replication or I want stronger, you know, wider or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Uh where is it happening on the working group for for sure? Here's the link to the uh, where the document's being tracked, uh, the GitHub, if you want to go make changes and submit patches, uh, questions, everyone should know my email. So how did we do time-wise? Well, technically speaking, it's an individual draft. It is yeah. quite in the working group. Yeah. Yes. But yes. Well, actually, well, it's, it's in the, just came uh, there. <laughs> it's, it's in the, the, not the agenda, what's the... Uh, But the set of issues that we're tracking now, it's made its way onto the road milestone list. Milestone list. Yeah. So. All right. And everyone turn on the camera now so that we can see whether you're banging your heads up here. <laughs> 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 we all. Good. Yeah. Mission accomplished. Heads are banged. <laughs> <laughs> Only one out of nine, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know, Tom. I think it's going to be a long road here. Yeah. But... <laughs> it's, it is, it's a better road than it was four months ago. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's no, ambitious. It's been a lot of thought in on <laughs> yeah. it. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. The, the thing is, it's the only way to actually scale this uh, to, you know, X, Y, et cetera. Yeah. Fast systems. 
between once you get beyond a certain number of files, uh, you know, the, the traditional server side um, iteration coding becomes, becomes the bottleneck. You know, yeah. You just move from uh, NAS bottleneck to, you know, the, uh, and, and at those kind of scales, you really want like stupid storage. Yeah. You, you don't want to have to, you don't want any smarts out there, you know, having to try to figure stuff out. Know, you're, you're talking about man, the, the data servers are managing multiple um, transactions and blocks in flight with the same mirroring of a file. That doesn't seem stupid to me. It seems like no, it's but, long but mostly it just has to worry about keeping track of, of well, it sounds complex. It's not like, uh, mm -hmm. Super it's not it's not as bad because most, yes, rock, because rock most rock. It, it's just most <laughs> focused on this well, thing, just storing blocks. Yeah, I mean you know. so the complexity happens almost always in the case where you're overwriting a block. Mm -hmm. And if you have an empty block, you know, none of this really matters. Uh, well if you have an empty block, then the client doesn't die. Yeah, yeah. So um it really only is a problem when you have uh, sort of multiple clients writing to um, the same file, or when you have overwrites uh, of you know that that same file, um, you know that kind of thing. That that's where you have to worry about um, you know needing to preserve either new data or old data. If you're writing for the first time, you know what the old data is. It's zero. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Thanks. I'm still three thirty. Yeah, that was your terminology, though. I think that's yeah. a good part.